out of uh, you know the mid '80s, about there, you got into uh, production with uh, Jam and Lewis. And um, can you talk about that experience a little bit and how you um, followed up with them after the time and and you know some of your highlights there? Yeah, you know, I, I when I quit the band, I just went home and I didn't really know what I didn't have a plan. I just went home and, and started writing songs and we had a four track recorder and uh, it's kind of the demo tool of the day and, and I just wrote I just wrote a bunch of songs and about nine months later Terry called me and said, you know, we've got so much work going on here with these projects. Um you know, if you want to produce, we, we don't have, we have more work than we can handle. I hadn't really thought about production or being a producer, but I was like, oh, yeah, why not? And so um, I started working with them. I worked with them for about a year and a half. And I think the first thing I produced and wrote was uh, Alexander O'Neill stuff. I did three songs on that record. And the last thing I did to them was uh, Janet Jackson, The Pleasure, pleasure Principle. Um, what a monster that was. Yeah. It, it, it was surprising. I didn't. I didn't even know it was going to be a single, and all of a sudden, they, uh, I don't know how I found out about it. But I didn't find out what the usual methods, but then it was like I think the sixth single in too. I I didn't give him a second thought to it after a while. All these other huge songs that come out. All of a sudden, they're releasing another one. And that and I thought, wow, six single. That kind of if it's been getting any play, it's probably played out already. You know conventional thought, you know, but it, it still went to number one. So. Yeah, I was a um, DJ in the 80s, and so wow. I played the heck out of all that stuff, and man, that Janet record just could never fail. You know? Yeah, it was interesting, because I don't, you know, when we first started working on it, it, it was like, oh, Janet, you know, and, oh, yeah, of course it's a Jackson, and then Jackson, and Janet, and but she hadn't had a big record yet. You know, it's just interesting that as the record started being made, it, it just started to be these rumblings of, you know, this could be a big record. Well, okay. You know, you never know. I mean, if everything's going to be a big record by the record label. You know, everything's fake, right? Until it comes out and it isn't. I mean, you just never know. But then it was all MTVs on board. And, you know, it just, you could feel this momentum, just, just hearing bits off in the I think what what have you done for me lately was the lead single, I think. But um, so, what is it about Jam and Lewis, in your opinion, that makes them so successful in what they do in their production and and working with so many different artists? Um, they complement each other very well. Um, they, they can play off each other's strengths and, um, boy, I mean, they've got, a, they obviously got a lot going for them, you know, I mean, they, 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 they all they wanted to do was make hit records, Jimmy in particular. That's all he's ever wanted to do, and you know, when you have a singular purpose like that, a much better shot at doing it, but it just, just you know, immensely talented. And you know, Jan used to be a DJ as well, so he, he was always real, had his pulse on what was going on as far as the club world and the single world, and I think that probably helped him a lot. Um, but you know, Terry, Terry was a great R&B lyric writer, and Jan was great with the music, and you know, there was overlap and all that. And Terry was, you know, he was always kind of a businessman, and uh, not to say Jam wasn't, but to my, you know, one guy tended to focus more on, on one thing than, than the other one. But and I think they just made a great team. They really, they really worked well with each other and they worked, played to each other's strengths really well. You know, when you when you listen to those records too, whether it's the Jam and Lewis uh, stuff with Janet or Alexander O'Neill or. Um, even Jesse Johnson's records in the uh, 80s and that Minneapolis Sam were just talking about 
and you know you gave credit to Prince, um, but some of that credit I think also goes to you guys. Um, where where does sort of the dividing line go from Prince's influence on that and what people like yourself and Jam and Lewis and Jesse added to that? Well, I don't know. That's a tough question because I think. Uh... Well, because I, I think some of it was very, you know, uh, kind of an extension of the time of Prince. Some of it veered completely in a different direction. So some of it was heavily influenced by that, by being, by, the, you know, that whole era. And some of it wasn't. And I think it's hard to say where we come and we, where our influences show up and that, that didn't come from him. But I, you know, yeah, I, I think it's it, it was certainly there. I'm probably not answering it too well, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, I, I do think it's a credit to, if I were to keep our own horns a little bit, a credit to the time that that everybody in the band, with the exception of Rome, who's not a musician, has gone on to write and produce number one records, of either of their own doing, with Jesse or or Morris or or to write or produce songs for other people that became hits. And everybody's had multiple hits. And I think that's pretty rare for a band. So yeah. I want to keep, keep, keep my horn for the band. I think that's that's a that doesn't happen too often. I think. That's, that really the entire band goes on to individually producing right hits for everybody, for a bunch of other people. Yeah, and the most obviously of it. That's uh, really uncommon. You know, when you think about just the unconventionality, if you will, hopefully that's a word, of, you know, how the time went about some of the things, you know, with the first record sort of being done by Prince and then kind of running with that to the extent that the time did to become such a proficient and great funk band in its own right. And then sort of a super group in reverse, right? You know, the, the, the band was so good and not really that well known, and then ultimately it's become a, a super group of sorts. Yeah, you know, and I, I think it's I think it's all of us individually just wanted to make more music. And we wanted that we're all writers, we wanted to produce music, we wanted to get it out there beyond what the time had done, beyond what Prince had done at the time. That's I think all we were trying to do is just we really like this. We want to keep doing this, and we did, and we, we all had some success doing it. I want to mention, I want to mention Monty uh, for the folks uh, watching. A few of the other people you worked with because it's pretty impressive: um, Cheryl Lynn, Sherelle, Delma Houston, Howard Johnson, Patty Austin, um, Denise Williams, Gladys Knight, St. Paul Jr., Deja, just to name a few. Um, very impressive. Are there a couple other ones within that that maybe? Um, pop in your head as something that was a, a, a really special experience or that you're exceptionally uh, extra proud of? Oh, there's a few. I mean, I made some great friends out of this. I mean, working with Junior, we, we and I, we and I, became, we, we and I became very good friends. And Kurt Jones with Deja, we became best buddies out of that whole after we did together, we put our heart, soul, and you know, so some of the relationships I formed out of working with some of these people have lasted all these years, and you know, that's, I'm real proud of that. It's, it's, we're, we're really doing the music for the right reasons. We're not just going in and cutting a check and doing it. We, you know, we really wanted to make it good a good record as we could. Um, yeah, I can't think of everybody. I don't know. I forget how you mentioned that. I, um, yeah, I don't know. So. <laughs> Were there any uh, uh, records in there that you thought, wow, this is going to be a big hit, but for whatever reason, it didn't really pan out? I thought the Deja record might be big. We had a couple good singles on it, and I just thought the overall sales might be more. Yeah, you know, but it did it did read respectively well, but I, I really thought that one might really go like, go a big time. So, um, but you never know, you know, is other. You just never know. I mean, I would have never guessed if you were here tonight by Alexander Neal would have become a hit. And I just, you don't, 
I mean, some people think hit, hit, I'm gonna write a hit, I'm gonna write a hit. And I have a hard time thinking that way. Maybe in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, I wanna write a good song. You know, that's all you're trying to do is write a good song. And when something does hit, it, it's like, wow, I actually, that's did well. I mean, it's grateful for it. And it turns out years later, uh, Rihanna uses part of that song and it becomes part of work. And so that it's got a whole new life. You know, last two year, year and a half ago, I guess it was. There had to have been a kick. Oh yeah, it was number one in the pop charts for nine weeks. It's just phenomenal. I just yeah, it's just like huh, what? <laughs> okay. So well, yeah, I'm grateful for it. Things happen. It's I'm just grateful for everything that's happened in musical life. When you guys came back, reunited, everyone was super excited. You guys reunited in 1990, and you were in the film, also a Pandemonium album. And um, this album had uh, Jerk Out, and uh, that was the lead hit. And I actually have a little story for you about Jerk Out. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine's father was an extra in the video. So I actually got to go down to the video shoot you guys did, and I was on set. And... Um, I briefly met you. I'm sure you don't remember, but um, I got to get everybody's signature on uh, the first record. So, and uh, Monty's is uh, right there. So um, that was a great thrill for me. Um, what was it like to uh, get back together and go through that whole thing? It was exciting because it was it was now it was it was going to be just a record, and then the record turned into you know. The whole movie thing, and I remember shooting that video that day because it was uh, we had the skillet, and and it was actually flames around the skillet. <laughs> so there was this huge skillet. I don't know, ten feet by ten feet. It looked like a giant skillet. And we're like, oh yeah, you guys gonna be standing in there, and it's gonna be like real flames coming out of it. <laughs> wow. It was just kind of fun. We had a lot of fun with that one. Luckily, nobody uh, got singed coats in the process. It wasn't like the Pepsi commercial with Michael Jackson. Yeah. Fortunately, we didn't have any mishaps. But so you were there that day. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think that was in Hopkins. That was where they were. Well, I lived in Los Angeles, and you guys were local for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Huh. Yeah, well, it was fun to get back together. I mean, we, we thought, okay, now let's let's make another run at this. And we, that record is probably more conducive, or was more conducive of all of us because we were all a lot more involved. And we all did some writing. And we went over to Paisley one night, and, and Prince just said, "Hey, you want to take some songs? You want to take the songs? Do a, do whatever you want with them." And so we we started pulling. Where's Jerk Out? Where's Chocolate? Where's, you know, pull them up. We want them. And you know, some got re Jerk Out got rewritten a little like the lyrics. And some of it was just, we just finished them up. Yeah. And then some Jam and Lewis wrote, a couple Jesse wrote, I wrote one. And, you know, we all kind of just, but that, that felt nice because everybody was really cool. Did you guys uh, perform much in support of that one? No, unfortunately, it was another another thing of us falling apart again. I mean, we, there were all these plans. We did a bunch of TV shows. We did, uh, uh, what did we do? Um, or City or something? Night Live and um, 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 <clears throat> a few other shows. I can't remember right off hand. Um, Arsenio, I think we did. With night show. I, and this, this is all going to be a prelude to doing a bunch of touring. And, and it turned out, I don't think Jan and Lewis wanted to tour. They had a bunch of projects they wanted to do. And it was kind of unbeknownst to us, but that was that. And we kind of all went our separate ways again for a while. So, so and then you, um, what did you do uh, after that? Because I know shortly after, not too long later, you started touring with the time. But um, what kind of transpired for you in the early 90s? Uh, what was I doing, you mean? Yeah, 
musically? Um, it was a period in the early nineties. I didn't do a whole lot. I kind of I went fishing once and I uh, went through some stuff and it was kind of a regrouping period for me, not to be honest with you. You know, I had to uh, went through some personal things and and but I was always writing and always doing music. I, I was always writing. I produced some local bands. And, um, and what more is called, we had stopped touring at the time. I think we'd gone to Japan with, with a couple of different guys, without Claire and Jimmy and Jesse. And, um, and we didn't play for a while. And then Morris called one day and a couple of years, a couple of few years later and said, uh, yeah, they want us to do a show in uh, LA, a couple of shows at this supper club and we want to do it. And yeah, sure. And so we got Dean and and it was the, really the beginning of the new phase of, of, of I guess, you would, what the touring version, as people call it, at the time, where we had you know, some new guys come in, Ricky Smith and Corey Ruffin, and now we've got uh, Jeff, Jeff McNeely and Thomas Austin, and it's kind of our new lineup of what we've written, and me being in Morris. And we've been doing that about 23 years, 22 years now. So. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, the last couple of years we did more gigs, I think, than we ever done. The train keeps rolling. How's it feel to do uh, like the songs that were on the record you weren't on? You know, like the Ice Cream Castle stuff. Does it, does it feel kind of weird to start playing that stuff? No, not really, not at all. I mean, it was, uh, it's all part of the whole feel, you know, it's, it's all part of it's all part of it. So it's, it's, uh, after me at all, yeah. Were you on this one? This one was a uh, uh, came out two thousand four. I know it has lifetime songs on it, but it doesn't show the credits, so I didn't know if you were on it or not. Yeah, is that is that uh? I think Morris did some live stuff on there, right? Yeah, there's eight live tracks. Yeah, we we played on that. We did all that at the the studio tracks. I didn't have anything to do with, but the live stuff is all of it. It's the touring band, basically. And I think that was done at uh, uh, place in LA we played. I forget exactly where. House of the Blues, I think in LA. So that's that's what it was. From the oh. Well, 2011, you guys came back together again for Condensate. And um, first off, I didn't even know that it was in the works, really. I mean, it kind of surprised me a little bit in a great way. And I think it's a tremendous record. I love that record. I mean, it's really funky. It's it's got everything. It's got a lot of music. It's got a lot of great music. Um, how did that come together? It had started many years ago. It is we had started it really in the late nineties, I believe. And we started with, when Terry used to live in Minnesota. We really it was just me, Terry Morris, and Rome and Dean. We had started <coughs> excuse me, recording some stuff, potentially for a new time record, and we recorded a bunch of stuff, really, got a record worth of stuff, and Jim didn't really want to be too involved, he was doing other stuff, and I don't know where really where Jesse was, didn't want to be, so we were just kind of going ahead with it, and, and that was kind of the beginning of it, and we did off and on, we recorded for years, I guess, and then it picked up steam. Uh, in the mid 2000, I guess, six, seven, eight, eight, nine. It came out in 11, right? 2011. Yeah. <coughs> I think the two, three years before that, we started picking up a little scene. Got together more often, and Jam was involved, Jesse got involved, and it became actually a real thing. And, but by that time, we had a whole new set of songs we thought basically. There's a whole other time record. And, uh, pretty much finished. It. It's not out yet. Which I think is really good. Maybe it'll see the light of it someday. And then there was that special version that came out too that had the documentary about the time. That was a very cool package. Um, I think maybe that video is on YouTube now. I'm not sure, but um, if anyone can track that down or find it on YouTube, I highly recommend uh, seeing that as well. Yeah, it was part of the whole thing we did with Best Buy and it was part of the. Uh, CD and the DVD of the 
fun about Philly anyway. So what happened out of that? I was really hoping for being able to see the time again, perform all of you. Um, and then there was some falling out after that too, right? Yeah, it's kind of business as usual. And, um, unfortunately, because it's, uh, yeah, it just didn't happen. <laughs> unfortunately, you know, I mean, everybody can't seem to be on the same page, which is, which is, Tragic to me because there, there's a lot of things we could have done, you know, with all of that over the years. And then sometimes there's too many individual agendas, or somebody's trying to pull it too much in their favor. It just doesn't work. And it, it has to be, it has to be there for everybody. And it's, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to happen every time we get together. So it's, it's, it is what it is, I guess. How do you feel about not being able to use the time name for the record? I'm upset about that. We, 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 you know, uh, there were many conversations with Prince. I think Perry had the most of them, and, and at one point he's was totally fine with it. Uh, when he was doing the Las Vegas thing, the, the 3121 show, he seemed fine with this. And he said, "Yeah, do whatever you want to do, and I'll help you out. Whatever you want to do." And, a year or two later, he didn't feel that way. And, you know, you could you get in, there could be this whole legal battle about, well, you need to go fight Prince about this. I mean, no, I technically, maybe there's a legal case from what we understood because we've been using the name for years and you know, he owns the name. It's, you just, you know, I think you get a lot of mixed feelings. There's somebody's helped us and put us, you know, you know, it's just, you just don't want to go through all that. So we just said, no, let's just change the name. That's how it's going to be. So we did. Which I thought, which in the long run, probably, you know, didn't help because I think I heard a lot of people say, who's the original seven? And that's the time. And you know, you guys have a record out. So that, you know, that record didn't be anywhere near what the other records have been. You know, that's the way it was, I guess. Yeah. No, well, the family went through a similar kind of thing. Yeah, we sure did. Yeah. yeah, it was too bad because you know we were. Uh, you know, Prince has the right to do what he what he wants to do, but we, you know we we are offering him money, we're offering him a percent of things, and we we're trying to do a very business life, and we just didn't want to do it. So that's it's his call, and it's where it landed. But you know, this band was never started as a real, a regular band. You know, it was, it was always a band, but not a band in a way. You know? That's that's what uh, contributed to a lot of the complications over the years. Because it wasn't like six or seven of us who stuck together and incorporated and went got a deal and signed a deal with the label, and you know, it didn't come about as a normal band might. We came backwards, and even though we became very successful, it was just always things involved, or hurdles to get over, and which you know didn't help everybody in the long run. It didn't help the band in the long run. Yeah. So you continue to work with Morris. Uh, how has he changed over the years? Oh, I don't know. He's like everybody else. We've gotten older. We've everybody's got a few aches and pains. And, Everybody's kind of settled down more and settled into their lives, and he seems very happy. He's uh, I'm closer to him probably than I've ever been. Um, and it, it's everybody's doing well. We're really doing well with this version that's out. We just we go out, have fun, and we play the songs the best we can, and, and we we just have fun with it. You know, it's just it's not it's, we just have fun. There's another um, time record uh, a possibility. I would doubt it. I I don't have any interest, to be honest with you. But I mean, I would never say never. But I don't have any interest in this. Now. Not to say they couldn't go make a record. But I mean, we'll see. But I, I you start to do it enough times where the same results happen, and it's. You think, well, maybe this isn't the thing to do anymore. So that's kind of where I'm at, but 
like I said, I you know I've learned to never never say never in life, but it doesn't feel like anything. By that I mean, or original seven, that entity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's what I'm speaking to. Yeah. Um, so of course, Prince passed a couple of years ago, almost two years ago now. Hard to believe. Uh, for for us, it was like losing a member of the family. We felt so close to him, and he was so important in the lives of myself and my wife. And actually, my son was named after Prince. Um, so, really big impact for us. And knowing him like you did, um, how did that go down for you? And uh, I heard you say it was a shock, like it was to everybody else. But how do you make sense of that at this point? I don't know if you can, you know, when people pass like that. I, I, uh, it was shocking. Disbelief from all of us. I mean, it was like, what? This, this guy always seemed indestructible to us. He was just, no matter what got hurled at him, and, and you know, the, 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 you know, he's a human being, and he just, we all are, obviously, but it, but he seemed so indestructible in so many ways. I mean, he was such a, bold visionary he had you know he was willing to do anything you know um and he could pull up stuff off that nobody you know, most people couldn't pull off and he just he just he was a very brave guy to in a lot of ways you know, for that fear standpoint. and it was just shocking I mean, it, just, it just feels like it shouldn't have happened it feels like it wasn't supposed to go down that way and it didn't need to but you know it's like well, you know, we had a lot of grief about it for a while. At one time, the world did, obviously. It just showed up everywhere. Um, but, you know, you pick up and you move on, you know. We just all, I'm just grateful that I had the chance to know him and be around him and have some of his magic rub off, rub off on the rest of us and, and just to learn from him. And, and I'm just grateful for the whole thing. You know. Grateful to this for many, many, many things. What, what's it like there, you know, being in Minneapolis, being so close to it with Paisley Park, what's going on there, and the Super Bowl, and they recognized him for that, and the tributes and all that? I mean, what is the, the vibe like being part of that community? Um, you know, in recent years, I think people really became to love. He became a beloved figure in this, in this Twin Cities, you know, in the last, I don't know how many years, you know, and rightly so. And uh, But I think the people who normally wouldn't pay attention were paying attention, the mayors and the, the you know, and just the, the folks who weren't, weren't necessarily die or Prince fans, but they recognized what this guy has done and, and what he's accomplished in, life, in his life, and I think they really became appreciated, which I think he got to see some of that in his life, which I think he probably really liked. But you know, once he passed, boy, you could really feel it in this town. I mean, from everybody, there's, there's a hole in this town. Because there was always some, Prince was a guy who was going to keep it exciting. He was always coming out with some something new, something he didn't expect, or some event or something going on that just shook things up I and mean, it could be controversial it could be funny it could be amazingly great he just he added a lot of life you know? he, 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 was, he always wanted to be bigger than life and he, he really was bigger than life in so many ways what's the i'm sorry oh, i said so you know he's greatly missed what, what's the music scene like there now, Machi? How would you describe it? Is it still uh, you know, really blossoming, or what's it like there? Oh, yeah. You know, this Minneapolis has always had a really vibrant music scene going back to the 50s and 60s. You know, there were the trash men in the early days. They had a, where, you know, and, and uh, people passed through here. You know, Dylan was here for a while. Uh, Al Jarreau lived here for a while. The folk, the the rock scene, Soul Asylum, House of Du, there's so many I mean sometimes people think that these prints and that that whole camp, but there's so much amazing music coming out of this town. It has for years. I mean, internationally known guys and 
the jazz community here is really big. I mean, there's world-class jazz players here. It's, it's, there's a lot here for, for music, and it still is. And the hip-hop thing has gotten, I think, bigger. You know, Doom Tree and those Dessa and people like that. There's a bunch of people out there I don't even know of, I'm sure, because I'm not maybe as informed about that scene as I could be. But uh, the hip-hop things become really big here. Um, and yeah, it's, it's still thriving, for sure. Well, that's good to hear. I, hear. I heard great things about the city. I've actually only been there for um, a day. I was, I'm getting feedback again. I don't know if you hear that, but um i flew in for a day on a business trip and from the airport to the location uh, which was outside minneapolis i had a driver and i told him you got to drive me by first avenue uh, i got to see it and so we pulled up there i hopped out of the car took pictures of myself with first avenue in the background it was a thrill for me and then they wondered you know why i was an hour late <laughs> when you, uh, my, I, I didn't tell him why, but, uh, you know, I just can miss it. And I look forward to going back there very soon, I hope. But, um, yeah, I, I just heard terrific things about the city in general, not just the music. So Yeah, it's a great city. To go. I, I, I lived here all my life. I know you never knew I've got friends and family here. It's a great place to raise a family. I guess the music seems I mean, they have live music everywhere. You know, all the time, guys playing original stuff. Guys, you know, you don't find that so much in LA or some of other places. Because you got to pay to play all that. That's crazy. I mean, there's still, there's still guys playing all over the time. It's always been there. Like well, the show is called Truth and Rhythm, and I like to ask the guest for them, you know, how do they find, how do you find, Monty, truth in the rhythm, truth in the music that you play? What does that mean to you? Hmm. I, I think the, the truth for me is just doing things that feel true to myself. And, and, and I think of writing songs and uh, writing something usually that's true to me and, and that speaks to me because I figure if it speaks to me somehow, or maybe it'll speak to somebody else. If, it, if it's something that's got me emotionally charged and that's the kind of word that maybe it'll affect somebody else that way and sometimes that's true sometimes it's not true and it's um and, and I, I think for all of us musicians you're just striving to whatever type of music we're playing we're, we're just trying to be true to the music really and and, and uh in a way that speaks through us. So that would be how I would answer that. Very good. So how can uh, viewers keep up with what you're up to or maybe find out when the time's going to play in their town? I'm on Facebook, and I have a website, monkeymoy.net. Uh, so you can have my latest news and tour dates and things like that and projects I'm working on. And um yeah best place to find me are you working on anything that we should know about or just yeah i've been i've been working on a slowly but surely another record of my own i put one out about 18 years ago probably, something like that but i'm working on another one and but even more front and center i've been doing some music uh for a movie called blues man with my buddy dan Shemander, who, uh, uh, it's actually a really good movie and a really good script, and we've got some great actors involved, and um, we're, we're doing a number of songs for that. And hopefully that'll uh, show up in the near future. So that might come out this year, later this year? Probably not this year, but maybe perhaps next year. We're nice. hoping to film uh, this summer. As movies go, we haven't, but... Yeah. but uh, it's a little different piece from the record world, but um, yeah, the idea is hopefully done. And I got to ask, I've been staring at it since we've been talking, and you didn't uh, mention it earlier, but the record award behind you, what record is that for? 
Um, I think out which one you can see. It's, it's your right shoulder above the keyboards. Uh, this is Janet Jackson. There's a, ah. there's a, there's a control record and then best, best of. Nice. Best of Janet. Yeah. Here we go for so that's where the magic happens for, for Monty Moyer? Yeah, this is where I make music. This is my studio, my home studio. Very cool. Yeah. Well, hey, it's been a, a blast. I, I thank you so much. I know we went a little over, and it's much appreciated uh, spending time with the great Monty Moyer from the time and all those other uh, fantastic records from the 80s and, and 90s and still a part of the touring time. Thank you, Monty. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Wow, how about that, huh? Such a nice, humble, down-to-earth guy. Such a pleasure talking to him. Such a shame that personalities and money and such interfered with the time through the years. But I guess let's be glad that we got such great music from them and such great performances uh, that we do have. So with that, it's time to wrap up this edition of Truth and Rhythm. An enormous thanks to my special guest, Mr. Monty Moyer, the Times low-key big-time keyboardist who since 1981 has contributed to some of the period's hottest funk rock music. Also, sincere thank you to you, the viewers, and the listeners. Much, much appreciated for the support. Be sure to look out for upcoming episodes of Truth and Rhythm and catch up with previous installments on funkandstuff.net on YouTube, iTunes, and other leading providers. Please subscribe at YouTube to Truth and Rhythm. Very important. We need that show of support. Show the establishment you care about keeping the funk alive. And with that, until next time, as always, this is Scott, Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.